well, many of the tools that were then used as a seed for Chemhol. So one of the, the best databases on, on uh, uh, chemical compounds, small molecules, bioactivity assays, etc. So the, the European reference. And then after these years at the, at the EBI, uh, she moved to the uh, ICR, the, the, the cancer the, the follow-up of the Cancer Research UK, let's say, where she leads the data science uh, group and she's working on drug discovery and basically combining big data, machine learning, drug discovery. And this is kind of the perfect setting for her because it's not only uh, doing excellent academic research, but whatever it is that they do, that they design can be uh, readily tested, uh, I mean, synthesized and tested in the clinic. So it's kind of a, a dream position for uh, many of us. So before giving the floor to Bizan, I would like to remind you that uh, you can ask her questions through the web interface that you have here. So after her talk, I will pass uh, her on your questions and she will be very happy to answer, I hope. So uh, Bizan is a real pleasure and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick. And, and thank you uh, for the organizers for um, uh, for, for inviting me. I'm very excited about this. I just wish I could see everyone's um, smiling faces uh, all the time. Uh, so like, um, like Patrick said, um, my training uh, is really uh, started in biology and in, in uh, also pure computer science um, because I discovered when I was an undergraduate that I really wanted to combine the two. Um, and uh, through this training, I was really able to um, really almost sit and, and sit across two worlds and, and speak multiple languages, which increasingly is becoming a really important skill set for everybody in our field. Um, something that I'm increasingly calling translational data science. You know, it's not just enough to be really clever with the biology or really clever with the computation we really need to increase the generation of people who are bilingual and can speak both languages. And this is something that I care a lot about and, and I know lots of you do as well. So I'm excited to show you some of the work in, in this area. Um, just a little bit about the Institute of Cancer Research, like Patrick said, I feel absolutely thrilled that I'm there. Uh, the Institute of Cancer Research is a university, um, uh, uh, is a college of the University of London, um, but it's also uh, the world's leading academic drug discovery uh, and development organization. Um, at the Institute of Cancer Research, I, I wear different hats. So I head up uh, data science across the Institute, but also um, I have a focused research team that focuses specifically on computational biology for drug discovery, uh, which I'll tell you uh, some about in a moment. Uh, but uh, being at the Institute, like Pat said, is, is a true privilege because since 2005, we've actually discovered now over 20 drugs um, for uh, preclinical development. We progressed 10 of them into clinical trials. Um, and one of our drugs uh, for prostate cancer, Abiraterone, um, has been approved uh, by the FDA and now also in the UK for NICE and is being used worldwide to treat cancer patients. And I'll tell you little snippets about some of these things um, as I go through my presentation. Um, so um, cancer um, and, and oncology. Cancer is a tale of two halves. Almost everything in cancer comes in halves somehow. So I'm sure all of you have seen the statistics that unfortunately with us living longer, with our lifestyles, etc., half of us will get cancer sometime in our lives. And to be honest, if half of us get cancer sometime in our lives, that means the other half of us will be affected by cancer because we'll be related and, and, and loving of, of the patients who do get cancer. But it's not doom and gloom. So even now, even with the technologies and therapies that we have at the moment, we actually cure half of our cancer patients. This comes through combinations of the application of radiation therapy, surgery, chemotherapy, and of course, increasingly, the smarter targeted therapies. Um, and this is something to be really proud of, uh, but it means also that it really needs to focus our attention on where it is that we need to go and improve things. So like I said, about half of our patients are cured. 
um, and you know the, the cure rate at the moment is is tagged as 10 years disease free survival but actually the evidence shows that after 10 years you know the chances of, of having a return to the cancer are, are very very small indeed so what is it about the other half that we don't cure so the other half that we still are not very good at again come in two different classes some of them are the complex cancers the rarer cancers but cancers that we still have not managed to build up a really clear molecular understanding of their drivers and so what happens with all of these is that by the time we find them it's usually too late and by the time we understand them it's usually too late or the cancer has spread so much that we know we're not going to be able to control it then there's another part of our of our patients who do show initial response but of course like with um, antibiotic therapy um, can develop drug resistance and similarly a lot of the time that by the time we realize this has happened it could be too late the cancer has spread has changed so much that we become much more weakened in it so so this is really the focus of what we want to do at the moment and where all our efforts are, are going in. So AI has really, um, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's taking on a, a global explosion at the moment, even though it's, it's, a, it's an old field, it's not such a new field, but it is in its application taking on a completely global ex explosion. And um, cancer therapeutic discovery and cancer therapeutic development is no different. Um, so the way I, I tend to think about drug discovery is, um, although I'm going to show you one of those horrible linear lines for drug discovery later, uh, to make a point, I really do think that drug discovery needs to be a circular activity. It needs to be this rapid circle that we start at the clinic, we learn from the patients, we understand, for example, the drivers of the disease and, and the key vulnerabilities of the disease to identify the key targets that we want to take, we validate them, we identify hits um, that we develop then onto leads into preclinical development and put them back in the clinic. And a lot of the research that I do at the Institute of Cancer Research is really trying to keep the circle closed and try to keep the circle moving really rapidly so that we can deliver the benefits faster to the patients, but also bring back the learnings from the clinic faster. Now, AI and big data are clearly a really important component of this big engine that, that we are building up. And there are many areas where AI um, uh, are, is being utilized in drug discovery, both at the ICR, but globally, really. There is, like I say, a really big revolution in the application of AI to, to therapeutic development. So here at this stage of um, uh, the target identification and the target validation, um, of course, we need to prioritize the targets. We need to think about drug ability assessments that is now quite a widely used word. So is this target gonna be feasible to develop drugs against it? Uh, thinking about chemical probes that we might wanna use for target validation, identify target engagement barrier markers and experimental model selection. And as you validate the target and progress through, of course, there is now successful examples of the application of AI for iterative drug design, um, library design and virtual screening, all the way through to modeling um, uh, pharmacokinetics and, and pharmacodynamics and toxicity um, in the patient and then taking them through to the clinic and learning from the clinic, of course, utilizing AI in identifying disease drivers, mechanisms of disease recurrence or resistance to therapy, and then closing the circle again. And I won't talk about all of these applications, but I will try to highlight how we are using big data, computational biology, AI technologies, um, in order to help us make smarter decisions at each of these steps. So um, oncology is probably the greatest recipient of the benefits of uh, the Human Genome Project and the Cancer Genome Project and, and the fantastic technologies in molecular profiling, very deep, very large molecular profiling that we do. And the dream was going to be like this, where drugs used to be, you know, you might discover a, a potential mechanism by the time you've designed a drug and taken it all the way to the clinic and approved it, it takes you about 20 years. 
And then suddenly there was this beautiful story coming out of the cancer um, genomics, large scale cancer genomics efforts uh, going around the world, where we had the melanoma cancer genomes, compared them to the normal genomes, identified that, for example, in melanoma, there is a uh, uh, the, the BRAF V600E mutation in the BRAF um, protein, which is actually overactivates the kinase and drives the melanoma, we were able to very rapidly uh, design a drug that, that um, sits against this, uh, that inhibits this uh, driver, which is a very druggable kinase driver. Uh, we developed MRAF and immediately saw rapid response um, in patients. And that was heralded as this is the future, right? Now we're gonna do this for every cancer driver. It's gonna be so easy. But of course, this was one of a small handful of fantastic success stories that have come up and we were able to push the drug into the clinic within just five years. And that was amazing. But actually that kind of hasn't happened very, very much. And the question is, why isn't it happening? What's going on? Because we've done this. And, and um, we've done a number of pieces of work, some of them kind of a little bit cheeky, um, to see what happens when you do lots and lots of these genomic studies and try to come to a consensus of what is driving cancer and what is driving the disease. And um, this is one of the uh, papers that we published doing this analysis. This is the complete list of, supposedly, complete list of, of cancer drivers as identified by several independent um, cancer genome studies. The larger the uh, gene symbol that you can see on this, on this word cloud, the more studies identified that gene as a driver of cancer. And what you see out of this thing is two different things. Number one, I'm sure many of you uh, who are seeing this can already recognize quite a few genes that we've known about for a very, very long time, right? So we've known about EGFR and we had drugs developed against it ages ago. P53 is of course a, a, a driver of cancer, et cetera. So the really big ones are typically ones that we knew about before, although there are some sort of surprising examples. But more importantly, and what I think is really holding back the potential innovation in cancer therapy, is this gigantic faded cloud of cancer drivers. Many of them are gene symbols that none of us are particularly familiar with. We don't know what pathways they're following. And so after this initial excitement and initial successes, we sort of, as a field, as a drug discovery field in oncology, retreated back to our safety nets. So we would generate these fantastic papers. We generate lists of 100, 200 potential cancer drivers, and then we would pick the ones we knew about first from previous, because sort of that's where the safety felt for us. That's where we have the experimental tools. That's what we could develop. And so the sort of the innovation arc slowed down um, quite quickly after that initial success. And what I'm hoping to show you is that that innovation arc really does not need to slow down. The opportunities are very many and there's plenty for all of us to do together. Um, but one of the reasons that we retreated into this sort of safety of pathways and target families that we're very familiar with and, and have explored before is really the spiraling cost of sort of traditional drug discovery, this linear drug discovery. Like I said, you identify a target, you develop hits for it, lead optimization, lead clinical development, and then you go through the different phases of clinical trials. And of course, those of you familiar with drug discovery would know the painful exponential, more worse than exponential cost rises every time you step through one of these. And so if your drug fails down here, you've already invested many, many human years, delay time that could have been used on, on actually developing drugs that were gonna make it and spend unbelievable amounts of money and if you fail there, it's, it's a really, really big problem. So the question is, how do you drive the decision making much, much, much earlier on, bring it right to the beginning in order to make sure that you can ask the right question? And actually, you're not picking the successes, 
You're trying to identify the failures. You want to identify them early on. And you want to try answer the right questions to get rid of the failures and load the dice in your favor as you progress through drug discovery. And this is one of the first things that I did when I joined the um, ICR almost 12 years ago. I say, well, actually, it's just a classical investment problem now. Um, when you are trying to make an investment of any sort, whether you're buying a car or buying a house, or, or if, unlike me, you know what to do in the markets and, and can invest in the markets, whatever investment you want to do, you want to bring together as much information in one place and try to make that, that investment decision as objective as possible. Is the house close to a station, close to a school, etc.? But the problem with drug discovery was that the information you needed was truly multidisciplinary. You needed information from the clinic, you needed information from cellular biology, you needed information from structural biology, you needed information from organic chemistry, and you needed information from pharmacology, from systems biology. And back then, those worlds largely did not all talk to each other. There were these amazing walls that existed. You know, the biologists did the biology here, and when they were done with the biology, they kind of threw it over some fence to the chemists who did their chemistry bits here. And once they're done, they threw it over the fence to the next stage and so on and so on. And of course, that wasn't making the most of all the information and tacit knowledge that we had available to us. So to address this problem for um, cancer drug discovery at the ICR, we developed a platform that we initially developed for our internal use called Cancer. And what Cancer is, in effect, is a huge graph database um, that is um, connecting information about the key elements of um, drug discovery and the information from drug discovery um, and linking them together. And the way we designed this ago, because that was, that was really the big challenge, the way we designed it is that we identify these key elements, whether they are patient samples, disease definitions, so triple negative breast cancer, a drug or a small molecule compound or an antibody, a protein three-dimensional structure, a protein, a gene, etc. So these are the elements. And that meant with this design that actually any information we wanted to add here uh, was merely a link between two of these elements. Gene expression was a link between a gene and the sample. Um, uh, the experimental activity on IC50 was a relationship between a small molecule compound and a protein, and so on and so forth. And the nice thing about this, it meant that as new types of data emerge, it was absolutely trivial to add them in. So, of course, when we built the system, there was, you know, there was no big CRISPR screens or a lot of the information that, that exists now didn't exist then, but it was really trivial to add them in. So cancer really integrates, not collates, properly integrates and links through 10 billion, over 10 billion experimental and clinical measurements. And once we've done that, we were able to develop a suite of AI algorithms that, that are able to really bring out the information, summarize them and rank them for us in a way to help us in our drug discovery decision making. And one of the key decisions that you need to make in drug discovery is what's a target, what target do you want to go after, and what makes a good target. Going back to this retreating to safety thing, actually, you know, it's not completely stupid. We know, and, and we've published on, on this a number of times, that, you know, um, being a drug target kind of runs in families. You, there are some protein families that are totally blessed, GPCRs, ion channels, protein kinases, they are blessed for drug discovery. Uh, and there have been a number of successful drugs developed against them. So this is an analysis we initially published uh, in 2006, and then we published an update to it sort of about 10 years later, showing that actually the same privileged families pretty much are still the same privileged families. So you're not making too bad a decision if you say, well, actually, it's a kinase, it can't be that bad. However, families can only get you so far. So yeah, sure, Johann Sebastian and Johann Christian Bach were fantastic musicians, but not all the Bachs in the world were fantastic musicians. And my friend Jeffrey Brian Bach isn't a fantastic musician. So just because a protein is a kinase does not mean that it's going to make a fantastic drug target. 
more importantly, what about the families we haven't seen before, this innovative cutting edge that we especially need for cancer drug resistance? And the musical analogy I would say there is someone like Niels Brandt, who I'm a huge fan of. If you thought that all musicians in the world had to be related to Bach, then you would have never found Niels Brandt. And so we needed other ways of assessing these. And one of the ways, if we are privileged with a three-dimensional protein structure for our, uh, for example, cancer driver of interest, we can assess things about it. This is the structure of CYP17 bound to our drug, abiraterone. And as you can see, the drug is nestled beautifully inside this just gorgeously formed cavity. And this cavity is literally perfectly formed. It's the right size. It has the right um, elements within it. It has the right levels of hydrophobicity um, and polarity in there, the number of hydrogen bonds, everything about it is perfect. So what we did was we asked the question, well, can we extrapolate, look across all drug targets and see are there properties that they all share that we can then develop a predictive algorithm on um, and, and predict for new targets, maybe targets that, that are not Bach targets, they're not targets from families we've known before, but that share the same properties of these targets. So we've developed this um, uh, ligandability assessment that looks for cavities on the protein, measures a large number of geometric and physical chemical properties for these, um, runs them through machine learning algorithms and comes up with a prediction that says, um, no, this target looks, at least from the structural information, very challenging um, and would be very difficult to drug, or it's possible to drug it, but be prepared to work very hard and it may fail, or yeah, this one's a winner, so just go after it, um, which is really fantastic. And we do these, and, and we do this every week, we update it, we calculate it for every single structure in the PDB, not just human ones, every single structure, and we update it weekly. Um, and the nice thing about applying this, not only does it move you outside families that are already drugged, but it allows you to identify um, other possibilities to drug proteins that even may have been drugged before, but where you've developed drug resistance. This is an example where Cancer, our platform, identified an hysteric um, binding site in a well-known drug target where we're already observing uh, drug resistance in the clinic. The drug sits here at the protein interface, almost in the major binding site where you can see the yellow, and Cancer identified this other hysteric site. And one of the problems is that um, you don't know whether this computational prediction is likely, you know, is it likely to be an artifact of that particular structure or is it likely to be real? So one of the things we do in Cancer at the moment is actually we run Monte Carlo simulations. So you can see that for our particular uh, protein of interest, the site, which is this one here, um, through running these Monte Carlo simulations, regardless of whatever protein structure we start with, we always find that there are confirmations about 10% of the time, the protein adopts confirmations that open up this druggable site. And because we were able to do that, with, with a large number of protein structures, that gave us greater confidence that this site might be actually true. And since then, we've actually used um, fragment-based screening. These are our own fragments from our fragment library within that site and demonstrated that it really is um, genuinely a druggable pocket. There are compounds that bind in there and you can develop drugs against it. And this kind of technology, we now have three separate drug discovery programs, active drug discovery programs at the Institute of Cancer Research, precisely identifying these non-obvious sites on really well-known proteins um, that we are progressing through drug discovery because Cancer identified these sites for them, which is very exciting. Um, but the other nuances you can start adding, the more you, you build up your data, and, and this has to be an ever-learning, anything in AI has to be ever-learning, is you can start becoming really sophisticated. So, for example, you can make a, a judgment, well, kinases bind ATP, kinases are beautiful drug targets, Therefore, any protein that binds ATP is a beautiful drug target because surely it has an ATP binding site, so it's got a site in there that's already ready to, to be drugged. 
But the reality is, again, not so simple. Yes, sure, there are some very beautiful uh, proteins that bind ATP the same way that, that, that kinases do, and it makes a beautiful druggable site. But then, you know, the, the field of drug discovery is strewn with the bodies of dead projects uh, drug discovery projects on targets that did bind ATP. However, the mode of binding ATP meant that actually the site was far from easily druggable and very, very painful. Because we've got this weekly updated analysis that's being done in cancer, we were able to then like I say, have this ever learning algorithm that now is able to differentiate most of the time between really equivalent sites that may be the same size, the same rough shape, but actually some of them are really beautiful for drug discovery and some of them are much, much more complicated for drug discovery. Um, I spoke a lot about structure, but of course we don't always have structure. And we have lots of other methodologies in cancer that try to assess a, a target suitability for drug discovery based on other parameters that do not involve 3D structure. One of them, for example, which is surprisingly successful is asking the question, does my target behave like a cancer drug target when you only look at its protein-protein interaction network behavior? So leave that the function of the protein families are still biology and focus purely on a, a network approach, the same kind of approach you might apply to analyze computational networks or, or social interaction networks. You apply it there and, and you learn the patterns of interaction. And it turns out that you can really use this very strongly predictively. This green uh, curve that hopefully you can see is actually our ability to correctly predict um, cancer drug targets using this algorithm. So, you know, I've spoke to you about the structure, I've spoken to you about the networks and, and sort of family precedence um, and similarity to other drug targets. Uh, we've also got a sort of a chemistry-based methodology and an antibody-based methodology. And the surprising fact is, well over half the human proteome can be accessed with one of these technologies. There are so many opportunities for novel truck targets, and we just need to be braver at moving into the areas that are novel. So um, one of the other things that I'm really keen to break the misconception over is that now we're using this, this human genome. It means that cancer drug targets or disease, any for any disease, you know, they must be the drivers, especially in oncology. Cancer targets must be the cancer drivers. And I will say to you that the answer is actually only sometimes. Um, when you look, and we've done these analyses so many times, whenever you look at a large set of cancer genes and cancer drivers, we find this um, answer. We find that 6%, roughly 5 to 6% of cancer drivers really are already targets of approved drugs. About 15 to 20% of them are targets of small molecules that we already know about. They're either sort of discovery level or invest, uh, clinical investigational. But there is a lot that are potentially druggable. And what we also find is that actually, if you do the opposite analysis and look at the approved cancer drug targets, only a, a smaller fraction of them is actually cancer drivers. And so what we're interested in is really looking for these cancer vulnerabilities and therapeutic vulnerabilities within the disease networks that are driving the cancer. This is a collaboration we did with the um, International Cancer Genome Consortium for Prostate Cancer, uh, where we sequenced the whole genomes um, and exomes of uh, a large number of patients, identified as is normally done in these papers, 73 genes that were potential prostate cancer drivers. We fed this into cancer and generated a really well-connected network of 156 uh, core disease proteins that are um, that, that forms basically the disease communication network for this cohort of prostate cancers. And while some of the, I'll give you a different presentation, this is the same network but now laid out flat and, and roughly based on subcellular localization. 
uh, while some of the genes in this network are actually these driver genes, these 73 genes here, they're the ones that have this blue outline around them. Actually, a lot of them, a lot of important proteins that are absolutely essential for the communication in this network were not themselves in this driver list and they were not themselves um, uh, you know, altered in this cohort. They're not mutated or, or altered in any way. But by applying this network analysis, you identify that they are absolutely essential for communicating in the network. And what it means is looking at these bright green proteins within this network, actually what this means is that there are, you have all these drug targets, the bright green is targets of approved pharmaceuticals, the dark green is of clinical candidates. You have so many other drug target opportunities that you would have absolutely ignored had you not done this and, and made this analysis that you don't need to be a driver in order to be important for the disease communication. And again, we're actually working with um, Johan de Bono and some colleagues in the clinic on validating these targets clinically, these drugs clinically. Um, which brings me to this like very small sort of offshoot note on target validation. When we think of target validation, it's really important to do the target validation properly. Uh, because this, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this, is reproducibility crisis and the failure of so many experiments. Never ever trust uh, a really high impact paper that tells you that the target is, is a fantastic drug target for disease X. Always do the experiment in your, your laboratory. Um, well, occasionally some of these papers really are sort of making data up. Most of the time their data are absolutely true and correct, but only applicable within that specific context of the experiment. So it's really important that you do the target validation internally. We have at the moment these amazing resources such as DepMap um, that are increasingly doing this large scale robotic um, CRISPR or RNA uh, uh, like uh, knockout or knockdown uh, technologies across huge panels of cancer cell lines that we can use at least to help us um, in our validation experiments. But while the genetic validation is one thing, it's really important to also try and use uh, small molecule tools for um, for the nation. And to help with this, I'm not going to talk in detail about it uh, today, but to help with this, we have two fantastic resources that are interlinked with cancer, the Chemical Probes Portal, which is a, uh, a, a, an expert reviewed um, list of chemical probes that can be used for validation because it's expert reviewed, it's small, but it's fantastically formed. Uh, but of course, its coverage is a bit smaller. Please, before you get a compound to do your target validation, check if it's in the chemical probes portal. We also have Probe Miner, uh, which is a computational, again, AI-based technology that assesses uh, uh, active compounds for a target for their suitability to act as chemical probes, which have to be both potent and selective. So again, before you use chemical probes for your experiments, please check these two resources and just make sure you're picking the best probes possible for your experiment. Um, we've recently also published this sort of guideline on um, what you might do if you're trying to validate uh, a target, uh, how to look for the best probes, look for the, how to do the right experiments and what to do with different cases. So I would encourage you to look at that as well. All of the methodologies and technologies I've told you about, um, uh, turns out, you know, we're very successful at drug discovery, but even we can in no way begin to um, scratch the surface of the amazing opportunities that are available to us as a drug discovery world. Um, and because of this, everything I've showed you, we actually make publicly available through our CANSAR resource. Uh, we've published lots of things, both the methodology, the results, as well as, as the CANSAR database. Uh, it's available on this website. And at the moment, we're actually doing a really massive functional update for it. So it's going to look even more exciting in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so I'd encourage you to check out your targets and compounds over there. In the last few moments, I really just want to step back to the clinic. 
So this is all really, really fantastic from a drug discovery point of view. This is how we can build an armament of different novel, innovative drugs that we can provide for our patients. And, and absolutely, we're good at stratifying our patients and we're good at giving them treatment. But where we really need to think now is about the fact that the patient is an individual. One breast cancer patient will be very different to the next breast, uh, breast cancer patient and the same cancer patient will be different today to what their cancer will be like in two to three months time. So it's really important to try and think how we can objectively and efficiently tackle these differences and how we can react to them um, in a timely manner to affect the therapy of our patients. So one of the things that um, we've just submitted for publication as a collaboration with um, Udai Banerjee is uh, this exercise of being able to uh, individualize drug combinations for individual patients um, as dictated in the clinic by um, the, the information we get from them. And the reason for this is that I've told you about this resistance to therapy. What happens is we have a patient, the patient, you give them the drug, um, the, the cancer cell then responds really beautifully to the drug and the drug is targeting these pink cancer cells. It kills them off successfully, but really all it's done is kill off the competition for the other kinds of cells that are in there, which can then expand and then you give the next drug and then expand and you give the next drug. And the thing with drug combinations is if you can very rapidly, say at this stage, identify what are the different behaviors that are going on there? Then you can think of a drug combination that rather than just bringing down the pink cells, it can bring down multiples of these cells and, and reduce or delay the chances of uh, drug resistance emerging. In this case, we did this experiment with non-small cell lung cancer very rapidly. What we did is we are taking pleural effusions from patients um, so putting them ex vivo and testing a series of drugs on them. And we put the drugs on and one hour later, we measure phosphoproteomic responses to these drugs. We deliberately went for a small panel of phosphoproteins of about 54, because what we wanna do is make this something that is actually applicable in the clinic. The idea or our dream is that you'd be able to take the sample from the patients test them with the drugs ex vivo, measure the proteomic response, feed it into our algorithm. The algorithm will tell you the, the correct predictions for, um, for the right drug to give or the right combinations to give, and you'd be able to give it back to the patient within 48 hours. But in order to do this, of course, we couldn't immediately test it on patients. We had to test it on cell lines first. Um, and so we did this, and one thing we found is that actually for 35, uh, non-small cell lung cancer cell lines and for 17 uh, cancer patient samples, when we actually measured these one hour phosphoproteomic changes, we found very, very strong concordance between the behavior we observed in the cell lines and the behavior we observed in the patients, which gave us some confidence that actually a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time using this methodology would be helpful and applicable to the patient. Then we developed um, AI algorithms that try to predict both individual as well as combination drug responses. Um, oh, I've lost my, so, oh, I've lost my, um, my Five confidence. Five minutes left, Bizan. Sorry? Five minutes left. Thank you. Um, but basically what the combination thing does is it looks at, again, the disease network and the changes within it, identifies the areas of vulnerabilities and tells you what the best combinations are. And what we found is that it is incredibly strongly predictive, much better than, say, genetics. Um, at this, it can be turned around within 48 hours and we are just taking into clinical trials to show that this is actually an approach that can be applied in the clinic. Um, and then the final two slides is really to tell you that um, a patient is much more than just the genes and the proteins. A patient also has um, the pathology, the comorbidities, the other drugs that they are taking. And we need to bring all of this information together in one place to be able to really properly adapt therapy for a patient moving forward. To do this, we developed another platform called the Knowledge Hub 
um, which I'll, I'll skip over, but basically where one of the places where we've applied the same idea, but now applied it way beyond just drugs. In this case, we applied it to radiotherapy and we brought together information from genetics, radiation therapy, dosimetry maps and imaging, uh, longitudinal laboratory tests and results, clinician reports, but also even patient information uh, outputs. Uh, we gathered this information for uh, three and a half thousand patients. Um, and these patients are prostate cancer patients who did receive radiotherapy, but ended up about between 10 and 30% of them can end up with really severe side effects. No single one of these data was able to predict which patients were at risk of these sort of life altering side effects. But if we could predict that, then we could really individualize the therapy to those individual patients and make sure that they are getting the right treatments or the right um, schedules to make sure we reduce these um, debilitating side effects. And so we asked the question, if we brought all of these data together, can we develop an AI that is able to distinguish between the patients? Here, the orange dots represent patients with these long-term side effects. Um, and as you can see, by developing this AI, we were able to develop a methodology that would very accurately cluster and predict which of our patients would likely have these severe side effects. Because what it means is for the blue patients, we can actually increase the radiotherapy dose that we give them, while for the orange patients, um, we can um, we, we can manage their, their risk much, much better and I definitely have the conversation with them. Um, and uh, I'll skip this one. So just looking forward, hopefully this will show you just a few of the opportunities. And of course there are so many more, but just a few of the opportunities. When we bring these data together, they really are more than the sum of their parts. And we really need to look to a future where we are very brave at being able to work with the patients to make sure that we are gathering these data and collecting them. And remember, it's not about the collation, it's about the genuine integration, putting them all together in one place where we can have this sort of big data and big knowledge driven decisions for individual patients. With this, I'd like to thank uh, my team and collaborators, uh, my funders, and especially Cancer Research UK. Uh, and most importantly, I'd like to thank the patients who are always incredibly generous in their support for cancer research. And thank you. So thank you very much, Bisan. It was an amazing talk, a great overview of your own talk, of your own work, but also of the, the field itself. And we have a few questions here. So the first one comes from Salvador Capella. And he asked, would it make sense to have a repository of drug discovery debt projects? I know it might seem controversial for pharma companies, but it could potentially save time and funds, or at least show what has been already investigated or tried out. Well, I, I, I absolutely think so. Um, and we're trying to figure out what are the wind, roundabout ways that one could do this. So one of the, again, being tongue in cheek, one of the things you find is that sometimes um, people publish, you know, when there's suddenly a slurry of, of publications coming out, it's because the target didn't make it, right? So that's, that's one of the ways that you can start looking at it. But actually, increasingly, we are finding that when you do look at the data at hand, um, you can start coming up with certain patterns and deducing things that have gone out. However, I do think that um, increasing this sort of pre-competitive sharing of what's worked and what's not is going to absolutely propel the field forward and, and more of us should absolutely do that, I agree. So we have a question from Askar uh, Gaffro. Is it possible that early application of AI would impose conservativity on the drug development, as in your music analogy? So what are the possible ways to support novelty in drug discovery research? Um, so it's, it's actually a really important question. So as with any tool, it's how you use it. If you, um, and I will take this structure-based assessment um, example, um, a lot of the methodologies, uh, th there are now quite a few methodologies 
available both commercially and in the public domain to assess target drug ability, structure-based drug ability with binding leaf pockets. And all of them essentially use the same training set because there's only a small number of approved drug targets, right? Um, and typically, successful drug targets, the drugs are targeting the primary site. And what we found is that initially, and it was the same also with our method right in the early days of our method, that initially, basically, these algorithms were learning that the primary site is the most likely one to be druggable. And what we know from the work of Janet Thornton and others is that the primary site is typically the largest site on the protein. And so what these algorithms were predicting, basically the largest site on the protein is druggable. You know, it's a simplification, but that's what they were predicting. And of course, that's not true, right? Um, and so it's really about being smart in your overtraining and trying to think of what are, what are these things that you're now dominating your algorithm with, asking yourself the question, about whether this is right and really doing the tests to see how much further than your training set are you moving and what i've hopefully shown in the examples that i've shown is that you know we found many targets that had never been drugged before that are now you know in drug discovery and we've discovered those successfully um, and also this discovery of these novel allosteric and, and protein protein um, interface uh, sites that I didn't talk very much about that we've now validated in the clinic that nobody, uh, sorry, in the lab that nobody knew about before. Um, but does this mean that it, it will now know every possible druggable site? Probably not. It's just smarter than, than you know, what, what we could do before and, and a lot of the other methodologies. But the next thing is this ever learning thing. There's no point developing algorithms that take you you know, six years to perfect, and then that's your algorithm. You have to, in, you have to be able to develop light algorithms that literally learn every week as new data come in. Hopefully that answers it. Great, so we have another question from Stefan Tomiuk. Could you please tell your opinion on neoantigen-based personalized cancer therapies? I think it's early, but I think it's going to be a really important um, part of part of the equation. Um, one thing to remember is that unfortunately, cancer therapy and drug discovery is like anything else. It comes in fashions and trends, and immunotherapeutics are now trendy. Um, I don't think that will be the ultimate silver bullet that's going to cure every single cancer for every single patient, and that's what it is. But it will be really important. What we are now starting to find is that um, there are cases where this is really, really important and applicable, and then there are cases where it really, really doesn't work that way. And so a lot of the smartness that we need is really knowing when this would be applicable to specific patients and making, and this applies to any other method, any other drug, is really the stratification of patients and knowing when this is gonna work for them. Thank you. So Maria Jose Falaguera asked, could you please tell us about the benefits and drawbacks of polypharmacology with respect to drug combination therapy in cancer? Oh, I'd love to. I could give a whole talk about it. Yes. Um, so this is really, really important. And we um, massively underestimate this. Um, we uh, published a paper earlier in the year about pop polypharmacology, and we've got another paper um, that we've just submitted actually um, around HSP90 inhibitor polypharmacology which I think this is a massively underestimated uh, and underplayed area of, of drug discovery and, and, and really understanding the therapy. And one of the things we found and, and we discussed in this paper that we've just submitted is really um, how little we bother to find out, right? A lot of the polypharmacology that we, we either attribute, uh, for example, drug resistance because it, it's sort of there is something with the transporter or, or we attribute side effects because it's binding targets it shouldn't, whatever we attribute to it. A lot of it we discover sort of after the event 
And in these papers, we're actually making the call to make sure that we do actually test for the polypharmacology comprehensively of our drug and publish these data uh, as early as possible because you can end up using it to your benefit and, and both in the papers we've published and, and in this one that we've just submitted. Actually, there are examples where you really could, you really could use this polypharmacology to your advantage had you known about it when you first started putting the, the drug in patients. So adding this to our information arsenal is absolutely essential. Now, when you start combining the drugs, the question comes, or are you just combining the tox? There isn't enough information to show that, but in the clinic, that's the idea. You know, if you're going to add lots of different kinase inhibitors, are you going to start really emphasizing the same kind of toxicity that's coming in? But again, it's a data thing. If we, the more we know, the more we'd be able to design it um, out of the way. But also, I think we need to be quite smart. Again, utilizing AI to think about the scheduling and the dosing. In cancer, you always want to go for the maximally tolerated dose. Uh, but is that really the right thing to do when you are talking about combinations? And I think we need, there is now activity in this field. We need a lot more courage in this to think, well, do we want to keep going for the maximal tolerated dose or do we want to start dialing down the dose in order to smartly combine these um, drugs in a way that um, enhances the activity against the specific disease pathway, but reduces the chances of the combinatorial side effects? Okay, thank you very much. There are still a couple of questions left, but we already went over time. So the organization is telling me that we should kill it here. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. It was a great talk and uh, thanks for accepting the invitation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you everyone. Oh.